Thank you, Emily. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, climate change and how to integrate that into fish passage design. These are some of the topics I'm going to cover today, but overall this project is aiming to determine anticipated climate change in stream hydrology, water quality, fish, fish behavior, and then how to incorporate that into design. So a little background, we used to have a Northwest region and a Southwest region, but now we are the West Coast region. And with that, we still have documents on fish passage from North and South, but in 2015 or prior, they came out with a draft that's still an internal review, apologize for that, out soon. Um, and we came out with that as a West Coast region design. And in 2016, Anchor QEA looked at that, that document to determine what kind of effects climate change is going to have on those guidelines. More recently, which Mei Ling is going to talk about later, the Santa Rosa office has come out with considerations for California only, which is also in internal review. So I recently was awarded an internal grant and I was able to bring um, consultant on Anchor QEA. Um, we are contracting with them as of September and they're go we're going to do a deeper dive into those recommendations. We put together a steering committee and these people bring um, unique qualities that's going to really bring, um, be an asset and create a strong team to look at these changes that might be needed. So our first task is to go back to the um, Anchor 2016 report, the recommendations they had. There, it's, it's a huge undertaking. Um, there's only so much money in the budget. And so we're gonna prioritize those. I anticipate hydrology is gonna be the first thing we look at because that really sets the tone for the design. So we're already experiencing a locked in amount of warming, but literature shows um, there's a rate of change that's coming um, it's going to increase in the second half of the 21st century and how those trends impact facilities and how we anticipate that change is going to be the key to resilient design, sustainability and making sound economic decisions. So um, our current criteria is based off information from the 80s and 90s and NIMS has recognized the need to understand how these changes um, will impact fish and their ability to migrate. So we definitely need um, to address it. If um, you don't address it, you could end up with a facility that doesn't um, function as intended during the lifespan, or you could have a facility that's out of design criteria. If you need to take account um, into account future modifications, like if you don't address it up front, then those future modifications are gonna have a cost that you didn't anticipate at the start of the project and those modifications could bring on higher operating costs. So about two years ago when I started this endeavor, I did a literature review to try and see if there are any documents out there that already take into consideration climate change and fish passage design. And the one that I found um, primarily was Washington State's incorporating climate change into the design of water crossing structures. I think they did a fabulous job, but they did have um, it was well over a million dollars to do that project. But what they did with their partner, the Climate Impacts Group, was they developed a tool to determine future flows and bank full width. They took the 10 global climate models and downscaled it to Washington State, um, the Pacific Northwest. They did it um, by determining the temperature and precipitation out of those global climate models. And then the Climate Impacts Group took that and put it into the variable infiltration capacity um, hydraulic model, the VIC model, to, and out of that they got um, the mean daily flows. And from the mean daily flows, they were able to determine and establish the projected bankful width and that, or bankful flow. And from the bankful flow, they could get the width of the channel. And then that width of the channel then, um, the bank full, the future bank full width, just taking a simple ratio for a percent change, um, they could determine on 20, 30, 40, 50 year projections, how much wider, because with the additional flows now coming down, you were gonna see um, bank erosion at the channels and then um, increasing the bank full width. And so for culverts, for, and that would also change um, if you have a smaller culvert that has more flow coming through, you're gonna change your fish passage velocities through there. And it also, if you have a 18 foot culvert, 
and your projections show that um, a 20-year projection shows you should have a 25-foot culvert. The problem then is that you're in 20 years, you've reduced the life expectancy of that culvert, which normally they're designed for 50 to 75 years. So climate, climate change or climate variability. Um, climate is like what you see on the news. Um, what's the precipitation, the temperature, the wind? And it's kind of like saying down in LA is very arid compared to Seattle, which is pretty wet. But climate change are the anthropogenic changes that we see due to our human activity, and which is different than climate variability, which is just attributable to natural causes. So we'll be looking at perturbations of these key uh, physical parameters due to climate change to determine the biological um, responses of the fish and also the physical changes that we may anticipate in fish passage facilities. And from the results, then we could give guidance to how you could incorporate um, different changes you might need. So the design flow calculations in the current version of our guidelines are based off the time series of historical flow records and on regional regression equations. Um, we've heard some of this in the previous talks about historical records not really being good predictors of the future. Um, Thomas Painter's talk mentioned the decrease in resilience on historical records um, and moving towards forecasting. So we'll be looking at hydrologic projections that we can add to our baseline flows um, as a reasonable amount um, in order to account for future conditions. Here's one example. I found this rather interesting. It came out of the comprehensive plan on the Sacramento and San Joaquin. Folsom Reservoir began an operation somewhere around 1950. And in 1956, they had a record storm and the engineers thought it would only take a, a year or it would take a year to fill and it only took a week. Um, the 64 flood reduced the, the design flood from a 500 year storm on that facility down to a 120 year storm and the 86 flood reduced it further down to a 60 year storm. Their flood control uh, program um, has done things to bring that back up and to um, add protection on the levees and other things. So the ANCHOR report identifies current Technical fishways um, are sized based off of low and high fish passage design flows when fish are present. But what if the latter is designed for flow based off a certain time of year, but then the fish experience a change in timing due to change in snow and melt and snow melt precipitation? Um, Bart Bond also mentioned uh, subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley, and I know a few of you on your projects are already dealing with subsidence, having to create additional pools at the ladder exit, um, how to maintain dri um, gravity-driven water diversions, sediment deficiency due to an increase in bed slope or an increase due to um, an increased bed slope and higher velocities. Your auxiliary water supplies might not be sufficient. If there are greater flows over the dam, you could have um, competing attraction flows. These are things we're going to be looking at. We're already seeing temperature gradients um, in fish ladders. Um, they're putting artificial temperature modulations in because as the fish um, ascend the ladder, they hit a thermal uh, curtain due to the um, the reservoir being warmer, the surface water at the top. And so they're pulling water out from, in this case, at Lower Granite Dam, about 70 feet lower to get an additional 10 degrees cooler in the ladder. Um, it was causing a migration delay. The current screen velocity criteria does contain a small factor of safety um, for, um, uh, for the approach velocities, but that was based off of the information from the 80s and um, we're going to be looking to see if that still holds true. Along with uh, addressing risk and uncertainty, we'll be considering how to incorporate adaptive management on the front end to build in modularity as much as we can to consider future uh, modifications that may need to be addressed. And also providing effective fish passage is another tool in the recovery toolbox. The Central Valley Recovery Plan calls for establishing populations into historical but currently blocked habitat via reintroductions and to do this, sometimes you need to provide fish passage facilities that can provide safe, timely, and effective fish passage. The Central Valley Recovery Plan includes fish passage at impassable barriers, 
as one element for successful recovery and spells out specific projects in the plan that contribute to the establishment of viable and sustainable populations. Because fish on the valley floor, they're just more sensitive to that climate change. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat box or you can always email me and get a hold of me. And there was way more to this project, but in 10 minutes, I can only give you an overview. But I look forward to sharing with you. Thanks. Thanks, Jean, and perfect timing. Okay, so, I'm not sure how to stop sharing now. Do you just... <laughs> I'll, I'll figure that out as you're talking. We don't need to good. Don't worry about it. So, um... Yeah, so thank Jean. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, and that's Alexis Phillips Dowell. Alexis is a senior engineer at the Department of Water Resources within the South Central Region Office in Fresno. She has been an engineer for over 20 years and has worked at DWR on various San Joaquin River restoration program projects for over 10 years with a focus on leading and supporting the hydraulic modeling efforts and fish passage projects for the program. Alexis holds a bachelor's degree in environmental resources engineering from Humboldt State University and is a registered civil engineer. Thanks, Alexis. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about the fish passage improvement project that we're doing at the Eastside Bypass Control Structure, which has been mentioned a few times earlier in um, people's various presentations. It is one of the priority barriers at the downstream end of the restoration area. Uh, okay, so we haven't gone over in detail the overall um, restoration area. So those that aren't familiar with the restoration program, I thought I would just briefly overview what, where my project is as well as the restoration area. So you'll see Friant Dam at the top of your, the right hand top of your screen. Right now, um, restoration flows go through reach one, reach two, reach three, then reach 4A, which is the main stem of the river. And then it's diverted into what we call the bypass. And in this case, the east side bypass, where it continues down the flood bypass and comes back into reach five of the main stem of the river. So the flood bypass system essentially parallels the main stem of the river and provides flood control for the San Joaquin Valley. What's unique about this is historically, the flood bypasses only received flow during flood flows. Now that there's restoration flows, there are portions of the bypass that get flow. So the project I'm gonna talk about today is at the downstream end of the Middle East Side Bypass. So why is the east side bypass control structure a barrier? Well, it's meant for flood control, not fish passage. It's a six phase structure that's gated. I'm gonna talk about why it's a barrier to fish starting from the downstream end where fish would come up through the structure. So right now there's a two foot sill that's a jumping barrier to fish. And then salmonids and other fish would approach the blocks. That's not a huge issue for salmonids, but it could be for things like sturgeon and other uh, fish. These blocks are only two foot apart, so for the larger fish, they could have issues maneuvering through these. The last is the boards, which are up to four feet tall on the upstream most uh, end of our structure. That's also a jumping barrier to fish salmonids at very low flow. So I have two pictures that show the structure at two different flow rates, 100 CFS and 400 CFS. So at 400 CFS, as flows creep up, certain things do get inundated, such as the sill that would allow some passage. And as we've heard before, we do know fish at those higher flows do provide, um, do get through the structure especially at flood flow. But even if they could jump the sill and there was sufficient depth downstream, they may not be able to jump the board. So we definitely need modifications at this structure. So the project goals, first and foremost, fish passage. Provide passage for salmonids 
as well as improve passage for other resident native species such as sturgeon and lamprey. Then what's unique about this structure is it's within a flood control channel. We have to maintain functionality of that structure during floods. Also, because it is in a flood control channel and receives high flood flow, anything that we implement, we wanna minimize the maintenance after a flood. So we don't wanna to have to go and do repairs every time we have a large flow. So what we end up doing at this structure, essentially putting a bunch of rock downstream of the structure. And what that does is it essentially raises the water surface elevation at that very low flow so, so fish can more easily swim up and through the structure. So some of the features is it will be made of engineered stream bed material. That's just a fancy way of saying a bunch of rock with a bunch of different sizes that will come together and form a more natural like bed. So here's an example of one of the projects on the lower Calaveras River. So as you can see during low flows, you will see protruding rocks and an overall um, bed. A couple of other features is a low flow channel and a notched sill. So we are going to notch the sill and have an established low flow channel. So at very low flows, we can get sufficient depth to move um, fish at low flows and so that they won't have to jump the, to the sill for non-salmonid species. So another feature, because we have those blocks, we are gonna take out every other block from the four center bays, which will help with sturgeon passage, and then remove all of the flashboards on the upstream end of the structure. So here's a profile of uh, the design. It is, It does have the water surface profiles on it. I'm not gonna talk into detail about those, but I did wanna show a few of the additional features. First, the rock ramp is only a 1% slope. It is very flat. And part of that reason is to keep velocities low so we could pass a variety of species. At, at this point, point in the design, we're, we're able to pass salmonids and most other species at 45 CFS with the larger species such as sturgeon at a little higher flow of 1000 CFS. The other thing I wanted to point out is the two vertical um, lines. Those are sheet pile walls. And the, the first is for um, the most upstream end is for uh, structural integrity to protect the existing control structure from excessive erosion. And then the downstream end is kind of to end our ramp. As you can see, there's a, there's a big hole uh, downstream. So we have that sheet pile wall. Now you might be thinking, why are you creating another barrier in the river? And um, the hydraulics of the site lend itself that those sheet piles will be inundated during all flows. So it won't create another barrier. The other thing I wanna talk about is the engineered stream bed material. Um, one, our, we do not wanna grout our rock ramp. We wanna keep it as natural as possible. Now that does make it tricky in the construction. We're looking at fairly large rocks. So this ESM can't just be dumped downstream. It will have to be carefully placed in lifts. So we'll start with the larger, put the medium sized rock, fill voids with smaller um, gravel and sands in part to help lock things together and to minimize subsurface flow. We don't want our low flow to all go through the rock, we want it on top of the rock. But as you'll notice, it is going to be a fairly rough um, ramp. And part of that is we wanna make sure it doesn't move during flood flows. The other thing is we'll have a low flow channel. And so we wanna make sure when we place the rock that we don't have extreme angular protrusions that could harm fish during uh, the construction of the low flow channel. So our project schedule, uh, we complete the design uh, later this year. It is in a flood control channel. So um, we have to work with the local maintaining agency and make sure we address their concerns. 
will award the contract later the next year and then construct in the summer and fall of 2022. Um, really quick, I do want to give a shout out to Ken Forrest, who's next, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. They have been instrumental in helping DWR construct one of the levee improvement projects within this same reach. Much of it is within the um, Merced Wildlife Refuge and them, her and her staff have been great to work with so we can complete that project in one year. One quick plug, there will be a poster regarding this project. Uh, so I hope you join me later today. Thank you and back to you, Emily. Awesome, thank you, Alexis. Uh, yeah, with that introduction, I feel like I uh, should just go right into it. So next, our next panelist um, in, this, uh, in this panel is Kim Forrest. Um, Kim is the Refuge Manager at the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge Complex. She has held this role for 20 years as part of a 44-year career with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at multiple national wildlife refuges. The San Luis National Wildlife Refuge Complex focuses on managing wetland habitat for up to a half million waterfowl and a quarter million shorebirds, the second largest riparian forest restoration in California, recovering and delisting of the Aleutian cackling goose and captive propagation and reintroduction of the endangered riparian brush rabbit. Kim holds a degree in wildlife biology from Utah State, Utah State University. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kim. Thank you guys. Um, and thanks, Alexis. Um, so this is a science meeting and it's about fish. On, this is a common narrative that I've heard for the 20 years I've been here. Um, and Fish and Wildlife Service gets sucked into it, fish versus ducks, and it's not acceptable. Um, it's problematic, and you know various entities try to force us into scrapping amongst the beleaguered resources that we have, or various user groups. So um, all the resources have already been beleaguered enough and, and had excessive assault. So we shouldn't be sucked into this. Uh, Peter, Rob Peter versus Paul narrative. So I'm talking about a collaborative process that we've had and have been successful with. Next slide there, thanks. Um, so here's a map that I, I pirated from the restoration program. Uh, and the area I'm talking about is just upstream from the um, control structure that Alexis was just talking about within the bypass, east side bypass. Uh, Merced Refuge is on the pink. So Merced Refuge is part of the San Luis Refuge Complex, which contains San Luis Refuge, Merced Refuge, San Joaquin River Refuge, and um, the, all the easements in the grass, about 200 conservation easements here in the grasslands of Merced County. So I think it's pink because we're so easy to work with. Um, next slide. I can see it barely. Got it there. So I wanted to start with some foundational principles. Um, basically, the purpose of the National Wildlife Refuge System is to administer a system of lands uh, for wildlife and its habitat. That's it's a very basic organic act. Um, and you also rely on the purpose and mission of the individual refuges as they were under their establishing authority. So um, actually the individual refuges establishing authority uh, trumps the National Wildlife Refuge System uh, as a whole if they conflict. These are powerful laws with the uh, foundation in constitutional power and uh, the Secretary of Interior uh, can't, can only administer those what refuge lands to the extent that it's not inconsistent with the primary objectives of the refuge for which the area was established. So um, these provide very broad powers for managing the resources of the refuge. I don't see that. Oops. Yeah, next slide there. Oops. Next slide, thanks. 
So as you all know, um, the existing situation is, um, as I think Alexis mentioned, the flows are currently routed through the side bass bypass flood control, um, which crosses Merced Refuge. And I, I think it's about 19 miles where those flows run through the bypass and most of it, maybe all but half a mile, is on National Wildlife Refuge land or uh, our easement lands on private lands. Next slide. Thanks. Hard to see. Um, so within the incised bypass, uh, there's, or within the bypass, there's an incised channel where decades ago the refuge built a couple of weirs to capture the flows, whatever that comes down, and spread it out also using a portable pump, like in the photo there, um, and spread it out to create up to 175 acres of shallow uh, wetlands for, for water birds, waterfowl and other water birds. Next slide. So another pirated image from the restoration program. Um, here you can see the lower weir and the upper weir that are within Merced Refuge. And to back up a little bit, this area was um, part of Merced, was Merced National Wildlife Refuge before the bypass was built. This refuge was established, established in the early 1950s, so about a decade before the bypass was built. Next slide. So here's kind of zoomed in where you can kind of get the uh, geography of the area. Um, another slide from the restoration program showing some of the habitats uh, that you can see um, where the where the structures are and then an engineering sketch next slide so the problem is that even with the boards out of these structures it's considered a uh, partial fish barrier and yes i know that's a more a not a salmon but it's the best i could do uh, next slide. Um, and the problem is that when there's only about 5% of the wetlands left in the central, or of the historic wetlands uh, left in the Central Valley, uh, removing this, these weirs and losing our ability to uh, recreate those wetlands is a problem. This grasslands area of Merced County peaks at over uh, a third of a million ducks and geese and as high as a half a million, a quarter million shorebirds. And uh, Merced Refuge alone um, holds up to 100,000 Roskies, which is the largest concentration in the grasslands. And in some years actually holds over 20,000 sandhill cranes, which uh, would be the largest concentration in California. Um, next slide. So the restoration program worked hard to kind of create an overlapping, overlapping fish and bird habitat uh, situation and it got really complicated. And um, these are a couple scenarios looked at was wells and, or I mean this um, submerged fish screen and uh, never really got there. Next slide. So the Bureau uh, did a, conducted an analysis to determine the impact of removing the weirs on those shallow wetlands. This is the kind of the mind numbing alphabet soup tools that they used. Next slide. And here's the cool maps that resulted. So it graphically illustrates the loss of shallow wetland habitat. Uh, the most important is the uh, red, orange, yellow, depicting shallow wetlands, which is a foot and a half from zero to 18 inches deep. And then the, the green and blue is the incised channel. Um, next slide. So we looked at the Snowbird unit, which is a separate unit from, of Merced Refuge to the north. And uh, for background, the San Luis Refuge Complex has about a thousand acres of wetlands that remain dry every year because they, those areas don't have a CVPIA allotment and we can't afford 
to run wells and uh, low lift pumps. So such is the case with the Snowbird unit and uh, um, its water source is wells, which are generally defunct. So we propose to repair those wells and restore the wetlands. Next slide. But again, we can't afford to run the wells, uh, let alone repair them. Next slide. So we propose to um, build a photovoltaic array to run the wells. And we have a little bit of experience with solar power. Um, oops, that's the wrong slide, but there we go. Um, we have a 64 kW solar array, uh, array on the uh, on our headquarters and visitor center building uh, shown in that photo. Next slide. So um, removing the weirs, it, we also ceased um, our ability to use our portable pump um, where we lifted water out of that incised channel to create wetlands. And so these two options were considered using wells as we often do, and then these, this um, screened pump intake. And we opted for, the, uh, for using wells as the simplest, easiest, probably most maintenance-free. Next slide. Um, but again, uh, wells are more expensive than the uh, portable pump that has a low lift. And, we can't afford to run them. Next slide. So again, we propose to construct a solar array in our shop yard that would make up the difference in cost between the portable pump and the, uh, and the Wells family. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. So, and I did get some um, cost estimates, but there's a lot of variables and it's complicated. Next slide. So we captured all this complexity in a memorandum of understanding between the Bureau and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Next slide. Um, and it all boils down to money, of course after the desired habitat conditions are maintained or created or recreated. And uh, in this case, that's why I subtitled my presentation win-win, but it should be win-win-win because it's, we've maintained wetlands for water birds, we've created salmon habitat, and these are cheap wetlands, relatively speaking. So we kind of have our cake and are eating it too. Next slide. So we can skip this, it's a time lapse. Um, video of uh, re removing one of the weirs. Actually, one of the weirs was removed last, last summer, um, except uh, we pulled the boards as soon as we knew there were salmon in the neighborhood. And so for those four years, we've lost our ability to create some of, uh, some of that wetland habitat. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you guys very much for listening. I'm done. Yeah. Thank you, Kim, for the presentation. All right, and with that, uh, we will move on to our final panelist, and that is uh, Liz Vasquez. And uh, Liz has served as the Restoration Goal Supervisor for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program at the Bureau of Reclamation for the last five years. During her time leading the Restoration Goal team, Reclamation has played a key role in reconnecting the San Joaquin River, the return of spring run Chinook salmon, and the removal of our first San Joaquin River fish barriers. And with that, I'll hand it over to Liz for the last talk of this session. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, tackling fish passage and increasing flows at Mendota Dam and Sac Dam. So we've been talking this morning about how we reconnected the river and now we have a population that has returned. So now we talk a little bit about what next, how do we deal with those major fish passage barriers? Okay, next slide. Um, so I work as the San Joaquin um, Restoration Goal Supervisor, which means I deal uh, for the majority of my time with the infrastructure development 
of tackling the restoration goal actions. So there's three main goals that we talk about when we talk about restoration goal. Um, so first off, we talk about volitional passage from Friant Dam to the Pacific Ocean and back. Um, and, and we are talking about with that, um, that infrastructure development really be focused on those major uh, barriers at SAF Dam and at Mendota Dam. We also look at eliminating stranding and entrainment of potential fish. And so those are mostly screening technologies. Um, there is a fish screen that is anticipated at Mendota Pool and one at a Royal Canal, which is the canal that takes the water that's diverted by Sactium. And then finally, we wanna make sure that we have uh, the, enough habitat when those salmon uh, move through the river. And so that's kind of the, our third main goal with the restoration goal program. And that really is about setback levees at in and around Mendota Pool. And then uh, we also wanna increase overall the ability for restoration flows to pass through the restoration area. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the constrained framework next. So in the settlement, uh, that goal is 4,500. But the constrained framework was a process that we went through a couple of years ago that really tried to give us some focus um, in the near term kind of between 2019 to 2025 on what we would spend our money and time and resources uh, on first. So first things first. So this is a map that came from the constrained framework process. Uh, it gives some of the objectives and programs and the funding that we were allotting to the different aspects of the program related to accomplishment of settlement goals. So this refocus really did try to keep those first things first. Um, so what, what are we doing first? So uh, we, um, of course, have talked about this map already, but uh, just to keep everybody um, uh, familiar with the map, so uh, Millerton Lake and Friant Dam are off to the left, and then that goes one, two, reaches one, two, three, four, five, and five being the confluence of the Merced River with the San Joaquin River up off to the left. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the portion in purple, blue, and pink. That's really the seepage lands in the middle there. That's where we need to gain some uh, channel capacity for restoration flows in reaches three and four. Um, we're also uh, looking at doing that fish screen and uh, fish bypass project at the Arroyo Canal and Sac Dam project, which is the end of reach three. And then, of course, our Keystone project and most expensive likely expenditure, which is the Mendota Pool Bypass and Reach 2B project, which is in the Reach 2B area as well as in the area to bypass Mendota Dam between Reach 2B and into 3. Um, so next slide, please. So talking a little bit about seepage. So seepage is this uh, definitely a hard concept to wrap your head around a little bit, but you'll see the picture in the corner. Um, this is a seepage op uh, observation from the 2017 flood flows in reach 4A, and it gives a visual, a good visual of what extreme seepage looks like. So basically it's water that comes up onto agricultural land and either damage crops or damages the soils by putting salt or other uh, contaminants into the near surface that would affect crops that are growing on that soil. So when the program came to be, it was decided that when we put water back into these reaches that has historically been dry, that we also needed to address this effect to the near surface groundwater system. And so we created something called the seepage management plan. And we do have a, a, a poster on it. Um, and I would encourage you if you want more information, and um, there's the, the poster in Liz, you got muted again, just for the last like five seconds. Uh, not quite sure. Let me know if there's some way to keep me from doing that. Uh, anyway, so going on. So uh, anyway, seepage uh, is a pervasive problem and it's in several of our large reaches. We do think we need to evaluate, to re evaluate about 25,000 uh, acres of land to reach the 4,500 CFS goal. We have already done that process on some of the uh, properties in these reaches. So the, um, the red and orange properties have been addressed permanently for seepage effects. Um, but to reach the constrained framework goal of 2,500 CFS, we probably needed to uh, evaluate 
properties up to another 10,300 acres of land. Uh, when we talk about permanently addressing seepage, we're talking about either physical projects that intercept the water before it gets to the crop, so interceptor lines or slurry cutoff wells, those sort of things. Um, or we uh, can use a non-physical project, which is oftentimes a seepage easement. And that's what we've used here is seepage easements um, to um, protect these lands, to compensate for the effects of restorations for these lands. So that's one of the things that we do a lot of. The next, of course, is we need to get fish uh, past the actual barriers themselves. So Sac Dam and Arroyo Canal are a system that provide water to the Henry Miller, Henry Miller Reclamation District. So this is the most downstream diversion for one of the exchange contractors. And so all of the, the river downstream of Sac Dam would have been dewatered historically. So all of the water in this picture would have gone into Arroyo Canal and would have been utilized on the, the crops in the Henry Miller Reclamation District. But as we come along with the restoration program, we now have the seepage capability to have 250, up to 250 CFS of water go past Sac Dam. And we're hoping to get our fish around Sac Dam. So how do we do that? As well as keep them from going into that major canal off to the left. And so, um, next slide, please. The two types of technologies that are typically used in this sort of scenario are uh, either a screening technology like a V-screen that's on this picture or a flat plate screen. Um, so keeping juvenile fish from turning left into that Arroyo Canal, keeping them into the main body of the river. Uh, the other uh, uh, goal with this project, of course, is to get pa fish past Sac Dam. And so we are investigating uh, a fish bypass or nature-like fishway here. So you might be saying after taking pictures or seeing pictures of Sac Dam and Arroyo Canal, why is this taken so long to come uh, to be to come about? Um, this was actually meant to be our first project on the program, a big infrastructure project. Um, but we had um, some issues with subsidence. Actually, got to almost a 90% design on. Uh, structures to, to deal with these two problems. But we've had to figure out ways to deal with subsidence and to look at other technologies that would more sufficiently deal with um, the subsidence issue and still allow passage of all the fish that we're targeting, which is salmonids as well as some non-jumping fish like sturgeon and lamprey, um, like some of the other um, presenters have mentioned. And so finally, uh, the other major uh, barrier that we have on the system is, of course, uh, Mendota Dam. And Mendota Dam, you can see in the corner here, is a little bit bigger structure. It creates Mendota Pool and is actually at the confluence of the Kings River and the San Joaquin. Uh, the Mendota Pool Bypass and Reach 2B project is similar in the concepts and technologies that we are likely going to investigate to use uh, to address uh, some of these uh, same problems here at Mendota Dam. So fish bypass being the, the main one, it's about three fourths of a mile of a uh, new river channel in blue there. And then of course, uh, trying to get the safe channel capacity for the whole reach to be. So getting that ability to move water then reach to be up to 4,500, which involves both the reconstruction of levees and setback of those levees to allow for more habitat. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, anyway, and so this is the full footprint for the Reach to Be project. Uh, we uh, have been working on this for several years. The areas in yellow are now under federal ownership. Um, we are fully in active pursuit of the rest of the footprint. We are also in heavy design of the two structures, so both the um, compact bypass control structure as well as the Mendota pool control structure on the last slide. Uh, and we are looking to get those fully designed here in the next several years with an idea that we would complete those structures by the end of 2025. We're also at the beginning stages of replacement of Maori Bridge, which will be the first construction project on the Mendota pool um, and reach to be improvements project. Um, 
anyway, I know that I am out of time. Uh, it was a little bit of a high level uh, discussion at the Reach to Be project. So uh, I'm sure uh, if there's questions, people can follow up in the chat and hopefully I can give a little bit more information. Yes, thanks, Liz. And um, definitely, we do have a little bit of time for questions for the panel. So if uh, if anyone has a question, again, feel free to raise your hand in the on the screen function or submit a, a question via text in the chat. Um, but with that, I'd like to invite all four of the panelists to uh, to come back and turn back on your webcams and answer a couple of questions <laughs> from the uh, from the audience. But first, from from me, because I could ask the first question. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to start with, um, so in her presentation, Jean discussed uh, the importance of resiliency in fish passage designs. So I guess I'm curious in terms of um, your designs for the, for the rock ramp, I guess for the re rear removal and for the Sac Dam and Arroyo Canal projects, um, what have you considered in terms of resiliency? Um, and I know she mentioned some uh, potential things like fluctuations in the design flows and water temperatures and other factors. So I guess I'd be curious to hear from, um, from the panelists that are talking about a fish passage feature, how you consider resiliency, and maybe from Jean, what, what you think in terms of uh, how, how well I was doing. Well, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest issues here in for the San Joaquin system and the bypass system is subsidence. So that's first and foremost um, on our minds, DWR's mind. It is in a flood control facility. So anything we're designing um, needs to consider that. So we're kind of lucky in the rock ramp um, where that facility is located. It's at kind of the outskirts of subsidence and the way that subsidence trends are showing. We're actually going to improve um, fish passage a little bit over time. That also, you know, is going to, to raise um, velocities as flows potentially could increase at flood flows, but I think at restoration flows, it's it's captured kind of that, that range and that flexibility. But subsidence, um, luckily we don't have to build things really, really big for it still to operate. And part of that is um, because of its location. The other um, quick thing is we're actually sediment starved there because of partly subsidence and how much sediment we receive. So that could pose um, a problem later on. It, ideally, a rock ramp and a natural ramp would have um, some sediment supply as sediment leaves. Um, we're going to have a little bit of those issues at, at our site. But again, I think us not um, grouting things down and keeping them as natural as possible will help um, kind of make it a little more resilient. I'll go on mute after that. <laughs> Don't go far, Alexis. We have one question for you. Um, so uh, any other comments from the panel before we jump to the next question? I don't know if I... Um, can you hear yeah, me I just want to... If I if I can, I, I think, um, Emily, you know, and Liz and Alexis, you guys are on the forefront of the issue with subsidence, um, what you're dealing with. Liz touched on it a bit. I would love to have gotten into it more, but we didn't have time. Um, but part of my talk was talking about um, addressing it, and that's what Alexis was saying. With knowing these things that might happen, they just know already preemptively that they might have to bring in extra sediment, right? So they already included that, so, so they're aware of it, which is really good. Okay, Emily, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so we have a question from Will Halligan at Ludover Scalmanini for Alexis. Uh, is the east side bypass line to minimize seepage and reduction of flows back into reach five? If it is not currently lined, are there plans to do so? So I'm actually going to defer that question, I think, to Liz on a, a program-wide. Um, I'm going to dodge that one uh, a little bit. So Liz, if you don't mind, um, I'd go ahead and give that one to you. Sure. So dealing with adverse seepage, uh, we really are trying to take as light a touch as we can on 
the ground. We also want to be cognizant that our landowners have a lot of say on the best solution for their property. And we, of course, always go in looking at physical solutions to seepage, but it is really driven by landowner preference. And if they prefer to enter into some sort of a seepage easement or a non-physical project, which would allow us to basically leave them able to deal with their seepage problem on their land in their own way by allowing them the money to finance that we've chosen to do that. So a lot of times the federal government has acquired the rights to bring water up to and including the ground surface. And then the landowner takes that money and reinvests it in their crop land and, you know, putting in interceptor systems or other things of that nature um, as they know their land the best, better than we do. Can we have a related question from Peter Forrester? Could you clarify that the seepage mitigation is not for flood flows, but just for restoration flows and the incremental impact that they might have above the existing impacts from the flood flows? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, the image I showed was flood flows just to show what adverse seepage looks like. But really, the program is only required to deal with seepage that's caused by the increase of flow in the river from the addition of restoration flows. And so we have a monitoring network of over 200 monitoring wells. As we increase flow, we have real time um, knowledge of what it's doing to the subsurface and we basically iterate back and forth. So as we increase flow, we look to see what it happens in the near surface in our monitoring wells. And if we go into any seepage threshold or we, we think we might violate some criteria, we have to back off on flows. So it really is dictated by restoration flow being added. And honestly, there's no restoration flows when we're in a flood flow scenario that is dictated and controlled by the flood entities and not by reclamation. Well, I believe that was our last yeah, question right now. Yeah, any other questions from the from the audience? Does anyone else want to try uh, raising their hand and speaking, asking a verbal question to the panelists? We have a little bit of time. None so far. Right, then in that case, uh, I'll ask one more for everybody. So um, I'm curious. Um, what other alternatives did you uh, look at when you are choosing your designs for these uh, for these particular passage passage sites? And did the resilience of the design play into your decision at all? Is that for me, Emily? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, we can have a discussion. I'll start with you. Well, do you want to talk about the SAC dam as well? So uh, why don't I go first and I'll pass it off to you, okay? Uh, so um, SAC dam and a Royal Canal Improvements Project did have um, quite a bit of work on design and it was related to this resiliency question. So we got fairly um, mature in our design at that infrastructure um, area to solve the project of fish passage over SAC dam. We had looked at a bladder dam in that was actually what we thought would be the preferred alternative, the fix at that location. But after we realized the degree at which subsidence was affecting that facility, we realized that we weren't gonna be able to achieve our passes objectives using that technology. And so we actually did have to do quite a bit of redesign. And we're, we're really on the cusp of doing some of that key work. We're still kind of in the 5% um, type of uh, concept design level. Um, and we want to um, be as cognitive as and as conscious as we are to that durability question. So we're really at a point, especially with the passage at, at um, SAC Dam, of looking at the most durable option. Um, of course, we um, are not responsible for subsidence. That's not a restoration program caused effect. And so we have to be very careful about how we design things to make sure that we have infrastructure that lasts for 50 years, but where we're not, you know, mitigating for, you know, effects that are not necessarily caused by restoration program actions. Um, at, and then also at Mendota Dam and the, with the compact bypass, we do have a, a subsidence allowance that is used in all of our structures of 2.5 feet. 
Um, and then we try and make our infrastructure uh, basically flexible into the future. So allow for additional bays, allow for gates that can be uh, changed as we potentially have rates of subsidence going into the future that we don't know. And of course, we're hopeful that some of the new laws see that rate decrease. And so, you know, we we hope to make the built in some of that flexibility and hopefully we don't have to use all of it here in the near term. So Alexis, you want to talk a little bit? Uh, I don't I don't have that much more to add, but I will say that um, so we're dealing with kind of an existing structure and a small footprint. So it, it sort of reduced um, our different alternatives. But one important thing to us was we wanted something that we didn't have to have somebody operate the facility. So this option was really um, all about minimizing overall maintenance and operation. And what was cool is early on, I mean, we had, we looked at bypasses, we looked at ladders, we looked at all kinds of things. And we kind of got the engineers from the different agencies, fishery agencies together and kind of came up with kind of like the lowest tech solution. I wish I could say it's easy. I wish I could say we're building it right now, but we aren't. But it, I think it's a really good, um, Kind of not foolproof but pretty good solution to a potentially complex um, structure so any kind of bypass which would be nice because we're not touching the flood control facilities would still require pretty complex operations to make it work and it wasn't always best for fish so this i think was a, a good compromise um, to being really good for fish fairly low tech and wouldn't require a lot of maintenance and operation. So hopefully we'll be in construction in the next couple of years. And I'll be reporting on that during the next science meeting. <laughs> Sounds fantastic, Alexis. Craig, were there any more questions out there? Or did we get them all? Everybody's hungry, Emily. They all want to go eat. Yeah, they probably are. All right, well, with that, <laughs> with that in mind, um, Unless Craig has anything else there. Uh, well, we did miss one from Tom Biglione. Um, I think we can answer that one um, after the meeting uh, by email. Sorry about that, uh, Tom. Um, okay. Just so yeah. everyone uh, has, let's see, make sure I get the right monitor here. <laughs> Should I close close off the panel, or do you have some more uh, more questions to the panel? Let me uh, let me go ahead, and then I'll let you go after, Craig. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I have control you now. All our panelists uh, today it was a really good discussion and helpful. So I appreciate all of your time and appreciate everyone else's time listening to the panel. Um, bye, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you, thank you guys. And uh, just for the, for the audience and the attendees today, I just wanted to say thank you for taking time today to learn about the return of the Chinook on the San Joaquin River. Um, I, uh, Craig's going to give you some details in a second, but I do want to encourage you all to check out our interactive poster session, our interactive poster session uh, from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. this afternoon. Um, I think it should be a really cool experience. It'll allow you to um, to uh, join each of the uh, posters and talk directly with the poster presenters. So uh, please do drop in on any or all of these sessions during this hour and learn more about the efforts that have taken place for the posters. Um, I think Craig's going to show you in a second exactly how you can do that. Um, but the posters are available to view right now. So you can preview them as you eat lunch and take a break to look at those um, before you join the live session. Um, just as uh, maybe Craig, do you want to want to go into that, and then I can conclude at the end. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, Emily. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. As Emily said, we have the poster uh, session rooms. I've asked all of the poster session leads to open up their rooms at by uh, at least 1:20 to get everything rolling. Um, when you visit these, you just click on the join meeting button. Uh, you'll have to do that after exiting this webinar and it'll automatically open in your browser. And uh, if you wanna move from one chat room to another, just close out the one you're in and then click the button for the new one that you want to access. And uh, with that, we'll also close this out. We have 
one other little video that will play in the background if you want to watch it. This is an unedited section of uh, uh, drone footage of uh, fish uh, spawning in the San Joaquin River. So yeah, that. thanks, Craig. And then just uh, real quick as a reminder that this meeting will continue tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. for a second morning of discussion of the progress on the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. So we, uh, we appreciate your time and interest in the restoration program. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon, and hopefully we'll see you both at our poster session at 1.30 this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Thanks, Craig. Thank you.